my wife is telling me things like, um, you're, you're so unattractive to me that, uh, we are going to be celibate until you uh, weigh in in front of me once a week, naked, on a scale. And when I believe, in my judgment, that you have lost enough weight, we can resume a normal sexual relationship. After she tells me that, a few weeks later, she gives me a vivid description of her sexual attraction to another man. And when a man feels trapped, he thinks of a means of escape. And for me, it's true. that means of escape was getting acquainted with a firearm well enough to stick it in my mouth and- All right, guys, you looking at the thumbnail, you looking at the title of the video, y'all already know what time it is. It is time to get active. Guys, much different discussion today, but I think it's very appropriate to be able to review, all right? Now, within my Patreon, within my Discord group, what we do on Mondays is what's referred to as Masculinity Mondays, where we either throw up different topics for all of the dudes to come in and kind of weigh in on and, in effect, to enhance or increase their value or understanding of masculinity or manhood within their life. Sometimes I bring through guests as well, and I had a guest that came through a few months back by the name of Timothy Golden. Now, Dr. Golden gave a TED Talk a few years back, and the name of that TED Talk was Suffering in Silence, The Emotional Abuse of Men. It was received extremely positively, as you could see right here. So what I asked him to do is to give a discuss, kind of like a part two or a deeper dive into that conversation that he had on TED Talk and the way that he was able to talk about how his trauma that he experienced back in his childhood affected his relationships and specifically the relationship that he had with his former wife, I think is an experience that we should all learn from. So I'm going to rebring that clip back up and we're going to review it right now so without further ado let me bring up tim tim how are you sir i'm doing well mtr thank you so much for having me brother i'm blessed and humbled to be here with you in this community tonight thank you so i wanted to give you the podium i wanted to get back down in there and kind of let you do your thing is that all right that's just fine man thank you so okay. much i sure appreciate you Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. And as I said to MTR, I'm blessed to be here. I was very fortunate to have come across this community through the Mediocre Tutorials and Reviews YouTube channel. I am a big fan of the content there and the work that he's doing is just incredible. So if I can in some way play a small role in helping facilitate the growth of this community and the insight and comfort that it provides, then I will have counted myself to be uh, very fortunate indeed. So I'm, I'm very glad to be with you this evening. So uh, the topic tonight is a topic that we don't even really hear about that much. It's the emotional abuse of men. So I'm the youngest of seven children, born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I grew up in a home that was a masculine home indeed. Uh, I had three brothers and three sisters. I call myself the tiebreaker. I'm the youngest, I was the last. So my parents had four boys and three girls. Growing up for me as the youngest, it was like having four fathers and four mothers. The first point of reference here is before I get to, to my marriage, which certainly was a problem, I wanna talk a little bit about my childhood because I had a relationship with an older brother of mine that was an unhealthy relationship that set me up for the abuse that I endured during my marriage. Pay attention. So I had a br brother who was four years older than me. Um, and your big brother is supposed to be your big brother. You know, bullies in the neighborhood, you go to your big brother. When you turn 11, 12, you start wanting to talk to girls, you go to your big brother. Well, I did those things 
But my big brother growing up was not the best of big brothers. It was a relationship between brothers that was so unhealthy that rather than having my older brother sort of stand up for me, he ended up leading the charge against me. Mm. So in the neighborhood, when it was time to call names or, or cast dispersions and say unkind things as kids do, other kids in the neighborhood are looking at my brother and he's leading the charge. And I would ask him things like how to talk to girls. You know, I'm, I'm 12, he's 16, I'm 13, he's, he's 17. I'm, I'm trying to figure this thing out. And he's telling me things like, don't no girl want you, you know, you're, you're fat, you're stupid. And what happens to me is at that young age, I begin to tell myself a story that I am unworthy. Pay attention. I begin to tell myself a story that reinforces every bad thing that my older brother has said about me. Mm. And as a result, I now have a narrative that is fundamentally self-destructive, but I still like girls. The natural desire for girls as a teenage boy didn't go anywhere. Mm. So I've got this lie that I'm telling myself, a lie that I believe is true, yeah. which is very powerful. I'm telling right. myself this lie, but I still like girls. So how do I get a girl's attention? I then became accustomed to saying to myself, the only way that you're going to be able to curry a girl's favor is to allow her to walk all over you. Pay attention. Is to be nice to her. To put it in contemporary parlance, as you would put it on the MTR, uh, in the MTR uh, conversation, I I learned to be a simp at a young age. Pay attention. Because of a dysfunctional relationship with my older brother. So those of you mm. who are out there as men who have sibling relationships, the first point that I want to get across to you is how important it is to uh, for brothers to uh, and for men generally to, men. to affirm one another and lift one another up so that the stories we end up telling ourselves are stories that are constructive and healthy rather than destructive and unhealthy. So now before I, I learn how to sort of before he continues on, just real quick. This is why I think like the diversity of thought is just so important um, within the space, right? Like for myself, I grew up in an only child and it was just my pop father was there. And sometimes I do take for granted the impact that he had within my life as to the way that I think about things and that looking at the way that he parented me, he also put me in controlled environments where I didn't experience trauma like that. And if there was some things that was happening, he was always... Um, a lending ear if, you know, I wanted to talk about just like different things that were happening within my life. Um, but I, you know, this is why it's so important for, you know, when I talk about and I hear the way that different people talk about things. And I always often think back to um, what are the things that you're actively doing to remove the trauma that has happened to you within your life? Because it seems as, with, as though the decisions that you are currently making or the people that you are allowing within your life, you're doing so because of some type of inadequacy, some type of insecurity. There's a lack of confidence here. There's a lack of belief in yourself. And that's ever more present in the decisions that you are making. Okay. So you have to understand that. And the crazy shit is, is that it's a windy path down towards bullshit. If you find yourself caught up in the whirlwind of bad decisions, because the bad decisions brings you a lower down, brings you amongst lower performing people who make lower uh, class decisions, right? Which then inflicts more torment in your life when something goes wrong, when something goes amiss. His story gets even more incredible. So let's proceed. You deal with women in this terribly dysfunctional way. And I met my wife. 
I got married at the age of 25, my ex-wife now. I got married at the age of, of, I'm sorry, I got married at the age of 28. My ex-wife was 25. And my marriage took place in the context of a religious community, a Christian community. This is the second point of reference I want you to take away from tonight's discussion. A Christian community and religious communities as well intended as they may be pay attention and i'm not here to bash religious religion or christianity or anything i i myself am a christian so i'm not going to i'm not here to talk bad about christianity but what i am here to do is to say that within many christian communities there is a level of dysfunction that is theologically reinforced through toxic interpretations of the marriage doctrine. And there are utopian standards of masculinity, messianic standards of masculinity that are thrust onto black men. Yep. Black men in many of these religious communities are told to be like Christ. Well, yes. what does it mean to be like Christ? Most Bible scholars will tell comparison. you nowadays that Jesus was a person of color. Jesus in first century Palestine is very unlikely that Jesus was had European features. So here you have this black man, this racialized man who Christian theology tells us must die in order to save humanity. So you have a theological paradigm of a man of color who has to die in order to save everyone else. And black mm. men are told to be like this man. So what ends up happening is now I have a narrative from my boyhood that tells me not to allow my emotions to rule. And now I have a theological paradigm that tells me I have to sacrifice myself in order for my Life. wife and my household to be saved. And mm. you can see where this is going. Now, within the marriage, I want to, st I want to stick with this, this paradigm of being like Jesus. Because salvation, in the Christian sense, theologically, is really a zero-sum game. Jesus dies so we can live. And you tell me to be like Jesus, that means I have to die so you can live. And the question becomes, what does the Christian woman really have to do? What are the responsibilities of the Christian woman in the context of a marriage where she begins to see from pulpit and hear from pulpit and pew that her man must give all in order to save her? Mm. Now, there's nothing wrong with a man wanting to give his all for a woman. I don't want this to be misunderstood. There's nothing wrong with a man wanting to give a thousand percent to his relationship. Mm -hmm. But there is something wrong when those efforts are undertaken in a dysfunctional attempt to win her love as opposed to a functional, healthy response to love that she is already giving you. And mm. this distinction is lost on a lot of men, a lot, on a lot of good quality Christian men in the church who end up buying into these messianic utopian standards of masculinity to such a degree that they sacrifice themselves completely their purpose, happy wife, their happy goals, life. their natural endowments, their, their in, in the Christian parlance, they, we speak of spiritual gifts. People may have certain gifts that are, are and that end up being sacrificed on the altar of this messianic utopian masculinity that is fundamentally unreachable, all the while living in relationship with a woman who is being told again from pulpit and pew that this is what she is entitled to. Oh. I'm married to a woman. 
who throughout the course of the marriage repeatedly spoke of how my size, my weight, made me sexually unattractive to her. And I saw red flags before I got married, but when you are conditioned as I was through an unhealthy relationship with a male sibling, right? Uh, and this is where men and men, brothers, brothers must stick together. So, so here I am in this, this marriage against the backdrop of, of these various dysfunctions. And I'm within a community that tells me I have to die in order for my wife to live. And that my wife doesn't really have to do anything except pray that I will do it. And my wife is telling me things like, um, you're, you're so unattractive to me that uh, we are going to be celibate until you uh, weigh in in front of me once a week, naked, on a scale, and when I believe, in my judgment, that you have lost enough weight, we can resume a normal sexual relationship. After she tells me that, a few weeks later, she gives me a vivid description of her sexual attraction to another man. I just completely checked out emotionally of the relationship. And for the Christian men who are listening, and for those who are just faithful good men, and I suspect there are plenty of them in this forum tonight, who are married and single. When you are married, if you are a good and decent man, and certainly if you are a Christian man, your romantic and sexual attraction is restricted to one woman in the world, and that woman is your wife. And when your wife tells you that we are going to be celibate, I just want the folk listening to think about the position in which that puts a man. Now, fortunately for me, and I'm, I'm listen, I'm far from perfect, right? I'm not talking about um, the kind of thing in a marriage where, you know, she likes R&B, I like jazz. She does this little thing that gets on my nerve. When you get married, you sign up for the petty annoyances of your spouse. You sign up for their character flaws, things that may never change. You sort of sign up for that. What you don't sign up for is a pattern of behavior that slowly but surely eviscerates your self-worth to the point where you feel completely and utterly worthless. Mm. And when I got to that point eight years ago, in the summer of 2013. And just real quick, you know, um... You know, I think that the worthlessness is uh, really specific to not just a withholding of sex, but then the vivid description of someone else. That at that point, um, all but all all, all 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 the shit has hit the fan. All all bets are off, right? Um, you've taken this too far, right? Talk about the complete and utter. Um, manipulation, right? Like in so many times, like I see married men who are just utterly defeated and broken, just utterly defeated and broken because they chose incorrectly. Now it's not to say that's all of them. I, I do know men that are in happy relationships and they talk about all the things that he just talked about that you have to just get used to living with someone throughout the, you know, for the rest of eternity and, and what have you. And just as much as I go over conversation of the negative, I think of the positive is also beneficial however this is a real thing emotional abuse is not talked about the thing is is when you think about abuse a lot of the news is from a physical perspective and looking at from a statistical perspective women are um, damn near just as likely to hit you as vice versa a woman hitting a man and a man hitting a woman just go look at the numbers but what's worse the physical wounds or the emotional wounds, the mental wounds? I'll leave you with that question. As you think about that, let's keep on hearing his story. 
suicide became the real option because I'm in a marriage that tells me that I have to die in order to live, but that is really making me sick. Mm. And if I file for divorce and leave the marriage, I'm going to be ostracized and stigmatized by that same community. So I'm trapped. And when a man feels trapped, he thinks of a means of escape. And for me, it's true. that means of escape was getting acquainted with a firearm well enough to stick it in my mouth and blow my brains through the top of my head. And I was just a couple of weeks away from doing it. Fortunately, I went, sought out therapy, and I began to slowly but surely recover. And But the marriage, right? Emotionally, a lot of people in Christian communities have failed to understand the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Mm. If me and MTR are walking down the street together and, you know, I slap MTR upside his head, which I would never do, brother. It's just a good example that, here. And he says, yo, Tim, man, what you doing, dog? Like that hurt. I'm like, oh, my bad, man. I'm sorry. Says, yeah, no problem. Forgive. Forgive him. We keep going. And it keeps happening. Right. At some point, MTR is going to say, yo, Tim, check this out, man. I'm going to make a right here. and You can go left and I'll, I'll see you when I see you, dog, because this ain't working for me. And what I try to explain to people is that I was in a marriage that was punctuated by episodes of hostility directed toward me because of what I look like. I, I, I responded to this hostility about 18 years ago, I went to a weight loss and I lost 75 pounds. My ex-wife acted like she didn't even notice. At that point, I began to say to myself, well, maybe it isn't really the weight at all. Maybe it's something else. But the point is, because I was taught to ignore how I felt or to at least subordinate how I felt because it was important to take one for the team. So I, I carried that logic about as far as it could go but it got to the point where my spirit was so broken that I couldn't go any longer. And even at the height of my dysfunction, when the thought of suicide brought a smile to my face, my top concern was that of my ex-wife, because I said, if I'm dead, because there's this whole question in certain Christian communities, right, about if you get divorced, can the other person remarry? And it becomes a bunch of theological debate and mumbo jumbo. I don't want to get into that here. But I thought to myself, well, if I'm dead, she'll be able to remarry. So even at the height of my dysfunction, I was so dysfunctional that I was still subordinating myself for her interests and her needs. And I was on the verge of ending my own life. And mm. so the takeaways here tonight, brothers, one... If you have sibling relationships, build up one another. Brothers need to love, on, blood brothers need to love on each other, and soul brothers need to love on each other. There's no room Big truth. for putting one another down, none whatsoever. Second, religion has to begin to accept some responsibility for its dysfunctional interpretations of marriage that hang men out to dry. And third, nothing in my childhood, while it set me up for the dysfunction of my marriage, excused any of my ex-wife's behavior and hostility toward me during the marriage. So although there is an explanation for why I was vulnerable to that type of emotional abuse, none of that excuses the way in which my ex-wife treated me throughout the marriage. And I'll just close with this. This is my last point. If a woman is seen with black eyes, broken bones, and missing teeth, we know there's physical abuse. But if a man is seen with a broken heart, a crushed spirit, and a sense of hopelessness, we sometimes say he's lazy or shiftless or trifling. 
There's a class of men out there that I call the walking dead. These are men whose who's, who's psychological and emotional demise has preceded or will precede their physical death. Mm. So the next time you see a man that is broken and devastated and crushed, mm. don't judge him. He might already be dead. Mm. Thank you for listening. We'll open it up. All right. Um, guys, listen, um, I had to go over that conversation. Um, again, did it several months back. And he hit on so many points. That, ref that walking dead analogy or reference is so true. Is so true. And again, I think it speaks to the trauma that one can experience in one's life, whether it be past or current. Right. And for all the ladies, the three and a half ladies that are watching this right now, for those that have brothers or those that are going to be in a relationship and, you know, the person who you consider your loved one, just there's just not that spark anymore. You know, you find themselves to themselves a little bit more, a little bit more um, depressed in the house, don't want to get off the couch, um, would rather play video games for a week as opposed to get things done. A lot of these men are the walking dead, broken in spirit. So I think it's key that you understand those behavior patterns and in a way to empathize with them in their particular uh, situation. Uh, Dr. Golden also touched on something that was very important as well, and it's the power and the impact of having male-focused spaces where the goal, job, and the opportunity to build one another up should be placed on a pedestal. It should be paramount to the goal of those that supply the content and those that interact with the content. And I thank you guys, because even as I look at my platform myself and even you know releasing the I Had Cancer video and seeing all of the love that came through, it really touched me to my heart. But I think being in this space, this whole sphere, whatever it is that you wanna call it, you know, we have the opportunity to build something that has never been built before off of the brain trust or the intellectual horsepower of all of the dudes that gain benefit out of this. Last but not least, I gotta touch on this as well. He talked about a man's response to wanting to escape and what his response was in that particular scenario and how he was able to go and get therapy to walk him back from that ledge. I've been at low points in my life, shit. One of the lowest ones that I just experienced. <laughs> you all experienced it with me. And we get these thoughts, we get these feelings, we get these premonitions within our mind. But just like I said in that video, and I'll tell you guys one more time, keep going, keep fighting, and don't you ever give up. All right, guys, that's my video for today. Again, I'll leave a link to my Patreon down below. I'll leave a link to Dr. Golden's original TED Talk so you guys can go take a look at it. It's a much longer. Actually, at this point, man, it may be longer <laughs> than my video, but go and check that out as well so you can get full understanding of this man. I appreciate his thoughts, his words, and this is what it's about. We got to have spaces to have these very real discussions because we haven't had these before. <sighs> Until next time, YouTube. Peace.